It's hardcore history. Attention. There's an interesting sort of phenomenon, I guess you could call it, that happens after we get a hardcore history series finished. You begin to hear from people that are connected with the subject matter, and you, you get opportunities, for example, to talk to them or to interview them. And the upside is um, they're usually people that you would really like to talk to. The downside is you've just finished up usually a lot of work and a lot of conversation and a lot of the audience's time on the subject matter. So everybody's usually ready for something new, but then you get all these opportunities that are too good to turn down that are on the bit of subject matter you've just covered uh, extensively. And that's the case today. Now, actually, we've held on to this show for several months. The author has a um, that we're going to talk to has a... A uh, new three-set book compilation coming out, and it's been delayed. I, I imagine November 2021 is probably a safe bet for it at some point, though. And so we were holding on to this so that we could release this and have it coincide with the um, the new offering. But what that means is I've actually got another show ready to come out real soon right after this. It's going to be another interview with another author, and this one won't be about the subject we've recently talked about. So um, one way or another, we should have a couple of things for you in quick succession, which is good because because we held on to this. We didn't have anything coming out uh, a couple of months ago as we planned. So you're due a couple of shows in quick succession. This one's with an author whose work I enjoyed so much. And, and some of my favorite little things that we included, these little hits by a, a little quote by an author, some of my favorite ones were by Ian W. Toll. And... Uh, he has multiple books besides these three, but these three from start to finish cover the Pacific War and the Second World War from about Pearl Harbor to the end. Pacific Crucible, followed by The Conquering Tide, followed by Twilight of the Gods. Any one of these, of course, can be bought separately, but with a three-book compilation coming out, uh, we assume, in November, uh, Ian W. Toll's, um, you know, his combined work on on this specific theater in the Second World War will be complete and available, and he's wonderful. And so when his people called uh, right after we finished the six-part series on the war in the Asia-Pacific theater and said, would you like to talk to Ian W. Toll? I said what you would expect me to say, even though we've talked about this subject a lot recently. I said, yes, please. So without further ado, our conversation with author Ian W. Toll. Obviously, you know that I've done 27 hours recently on this subject, and I'm sure the audience is going to groan when they see I have more of it. Uh, but what I'd like to do maybe as, you know, and, and I, I consider the conversation maybe to be going now. We're recording anyway. But but um, with a guy who has lived this like you've lived it, uh, you know, not just the writing of the books and the, and the research, but the speeches that you have to give and everything else— um, I imagine that you have all kinds of ideas in your head of things that have happened that make this conflict wild and crazy. Is there something that you wish the general public, and I feel like my audience now has 27 hours of this, so what can we tell them about this war that is unusual or interesting, or if you could say that you wish the general public knew something about this war that you know, what would it be? Well, I mean, there's a couple, I mean, there's, there's just so many things I could, I could say in answer to that question, but, uh, um, uh, why don't we, why don't we say this, um, that I, as a continental nation, we Americans, uh, we tend to think of, of war as war on land before anything else. And, and naval operations are a supporting feature of war, a so supporting operation. <clears throat> and, um, in the second world war, I mean, that, that certainly was true of the war in Europe. Uh, I think you can say naval operations were, uh, a supporting uh, aspect of the of the campaign, and then you need to invert your understanding when you come to the Pacific. You really need to just look at the map of the Pacific, and you you see this is a sea war and an air war first, and uh, land operations, these island um, island fights, were played a sort of supporting role in in the larger scheme, and so you know just from the very beginning, I think you need to invert your understanding in that way, and once you do that. Uh, the this this vast conflict, the Pacific War, becomes much easier to understand. <laughs> 
You know, as an American, uh, one of the things that we really didn't get much of, I mean, I have a, a Life Goes to War book that probably came out in 1950. And if you leave through the pages, the vast, vast majority of this work is about the Pacific theater, the battles that Americans uh, uh, who followed the exploits of the Marines or MacArthur are very familiar with, the Tarawas, the Peleliu's, the Iwo Jima's. But the whole Asia side of this conflict is enormous once you delve into it, once you start to realize how many people are involved. Um, why is, and you know, also, I didn't even think about this, but I mean, five years later, we're in a war in Korea. We have uh, Chinese troops entering the war after a certain point. I mean, that's all directly connected to the fallout uh, from this Asia-Pacific war. Um, why don't Americans know more, and this includes yours truly, why don't we know more about the the giant, you know, you, you mentioned the, the naval war, which it is to the United States, but there was a giant land war in Asia also. Right. Well, you know, I mean, the, the simplest way to, to answer that is just that, you know, we weren't involved in that war in a big way. And, and Americans, like most people, we, we tend to be most interested in the aspects of a conflict in which our boys were directly involved. So I, I think that goes part of the way to explaining that. Um, I think it's also true that uh, because uh, uh, Mao's China, uh, uh, communists won the Civil War after uh, the end of the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> China became for many years and in many ways still is somewhat of a black box from the outside. Uh, and so the, the telling of the, of the story, the history of that war uh, was something that was controlled directly by Mao's re regime. And, um, and there was just a, a limited um, access uh, to that country in order to, to try to tell that story. I, I, I think that there are good efforts now to try to rectify this, to place the Sino-Japanese War back in the center of the story of uh, Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and my, my colleague, uh, Richard Frank, is, is writing another trilogy about the Asia-Pacific War, as he calls it, in which he's, he's trying to rectify that bias. And, and so I commend uh, that work. The first of his three volumes is out. You know, when you look at the amount of uh, the amount of resources uh, we would say gdp today all the things that japan a small island nation had to uh, set aside and devote for naval construction you know over the 20s and the 30s and into the 40s um, modern aircraft development and and millions of men on the ground who need to be supported in asia you look at this and you just think to yourself and i think we said in the podcast i mean the japanese were already trying to eat an elephant in terms of of the task that they had set for themselves before they even attacked Pearl Harbor, then to attack the strongest Western nations on top of that. I read an account of one historian who had said that a Japanese, I'm trying to quote from memory here, a Japanese poet had described the war as like a, snow, a slow motion natural disaster, suggesting that the Japanese felt like they were almost like pulled into it like a riptide. Um, when you look at something like this, does it look like the Japanese had, I mean, I, I feel like they had no chance from the get-go. Uh, how does this look to you when you, I mean, you've examined uh, uh, all of the records, you've looked at this. Um, how do you, I, I guess there were optimists, certainly, but I mean, you guys have guys like the whole naval staff, everybody was so pessimistic about that. How do you think this, um, I guess what I'm saying is, do you see it as a one-sided affair from the get-go, or did the Japanese have a chance to do something really unexpected here? You know, when I consider the counterfactuals, Dan, I find it very hard to imagine any scenario where the Japanese could have escaped this conflict uh, with um, in, in a better situation than they were on December 6, 1941, the day before they attacked Pearl Harbor. It's almost impossible to imagine a scenario where uh, the war ends up working out for them. And uh, really what, <clears throat> what the Pacific War was from the Japanese perspective was it was an enormous bet that uh, that Hitler was going to dominate Europe, and um, and and that by dominating Europe, he was essentially going to keep the United States forever on the defensive, worried about the security of our own hemisphere of South America, and that uh, in that situation, we just would not uh, be able to fight a prolonged bloody war uh, in the Pacific. Now, of course, that was a very bad bet, and it was a bet that was made you know, right at, at the moment when the German army was being stopped outside the gates of Moscow, you know a lot about this. I know you did a, <clears throat> like a six-parter on, uh, on the war on the Eastern Front. And, um, and, and one of the uh, leaders of, of the uh, Japanese regime, I forget who, in a, in a, uh, being interrogated after the war said, you know, if, um, if, if we had made this decision just two weeks later, 
we might have looked at what was happening in uh, in Russia and and uh, perceived that this was not going to be a walkover for the Germans the way it, it appeared that it was going to be in the in the early months and that might have caused us to think twice about attacking the Americans uh, in Pearl Harbor and so uh, with that in mind when I when I go through the counterfactuals I think the one thing that could have really tipped the balance uh, throughout the world really but also in the Pacific would be a, a Russian collapse um, and and some form of a truce on the Russian front uh, if Stalin had essentially repeated what the Bolsheviks had done in 1917 and cut a deal uh, to end that war allowing Hitler to redeploy uh, his forces uh, against uh, England you know that I think um, could have have really changed the entire complexion of the global conflict in a way that uh, led us to to think, let's try to cut our losses in the Pacific and and not uh, devote the kind of enormous effort that it, it will require to conquer Japan at a time when we really do have to worry about our Atlantic flank. You know, I'm going to piggyback off what you said because I think it's fascinating. Uh, I spoke to a, a German once who had said that essentially, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but that we blew it in the East, that we were welcomed by some of the population there uh, as liberators, and our actions turned those very people against us and made our job that much tougher. I think about the Pacific and the East a the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, and, and this, this idea that it's Asia for the Asians, and the tying in of the Pan-Asianism, and the Japanese uh, portraying themselves as the tip of the Asian spear to sort of free uh, the Asian people from the colonial Western powers, um, you know, and when I was growing up, we were taught that that was just a, a fig leaf covering, uh, you know, rampant imperialism. And certainly some of the Japanese leadership thought that way. But the more you read, especially the more modern works, the more this seems like something a lot of people really bought into and believed. Um, could you say that the Japanese are in a similar position to what that German guy was uh, in? When I mean, did they blow it here by the way they treated the populations that they liberated? Could this have gone a different way had they lived up to the hype a little bit on the marketing message? Well, I mean, you know, certainly the Japanese would have done done themselves a huge favor if they had just treated the Asian peoples uh, that they had conquered um, more in line with uh, with their ideology of this sort of pan Asian liberation movement. Um, and and I think that there's you know there's a, a lot to be said for that traditional view that you were taught growing up, which is that the, the Japanese were were fundamentally out uh, for, as an imperialist power to try to aggrandize themselves, their empire, uh, to raise their standard of living, to plunder Asia. Um, that said, there was this this kind of messianic and idealistic strain of of Japanese imperialism, and, and certainly among many and, and of those in the regime who were shaping this, this message. Uh, there was this idea that um, uh, the Europeans have had their way in Asia for long enough, and we're, gonna, we're the only Asian country that's strong enough uh, to put an end to this. And we're gonna do that, and we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, take great sacrifices in order to do that. Uh, and I think that there were many Japanese who genuinely believed that, whether or not uh, their military forces were able to live up to it. And in fact, that view really persists among, particularly on the right in Japan today, uh, you often hear it said uh, by right-wing politicians and, and uh, writers and historians uh, that uh, Japan's um, uh, defeat uh, in the Pacific War was in a sense a kind of long-term sacrifice for the rest of Asia because it did lead uh, indirectly and directly in some cases to the decolonization of so many of those nations. Uh, and um, and the you know the the situation in Asia today, where you you really don't have any European colonies left uh, in in Asia. And that amplification, it probably sped up the process, certainly, throwing out places like France from Indochina for several years right. and then having them try to reestablish themselves definitely changes the equation. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, and Great Britain was was simply exhausted by the war, more the war in Europe than the war in the Pacific. But, but because of the war sort of brought um, England and, and the UK down in the world, it, it became clear within a matter of about two decades that they no longer had the economic wherewithal to maintain this empire. So that indirectly, you could say, uh, led to the uh, the independence of places like Malaya. And those places, of course, were some of the places that had oil. And one of the things I think about with this war now more than I did as a kid, and I think, you know, having 
Uh, my life straddles the, the early oil crises era in the United States in the early 1970s, and I think Americans uh, had, had a much better understanding of things like resources and whatnot around the world after the oil crisis. And so when I look back now and I read the stuff about how the war happened, especially with the embargoes and everything else, the idea of oil comes into it so much more than it used to. Like, I look at the war now and I go, could this have been classified as the first major global war for something like oil? Um, how do you see sort of our our, our modern, um, what would we say, we protect our interests overseas? We have global supply chains. We, I mean, in a sense, could we say that you see the early stages of this in the Second World War? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was it was clearly... From Japan's point of view, the immediate crisis that they that they had to address that led them to their decision to attack the United States and Great Britain in December 1941 was this oil problem. Uh, they had and have uh, today negligible domestic oil production, so they really had to import uh, oil both for their domestic economy and just to run their military, run their navy. And so um, uh, this was sort of a, the cynic on of the entire Japanese imperialist project is how do you uh, assure that you have a steady oil supply? So when we um, embargoed uh, oil exports to Japan, uh, essentially we, we, we started a clock ticking. They had stockpiled a certain amount of oil um, and, uh, and perhaps enough for about a year uh, to run both their domestic economy and their military operations. And they had to solve that problem either by coming to some sort of a diplomatic settlement with us, uh, or if not, by going and getting their own oil, uh, which is what they did by uh, taking the East Indies, Borneo and Sumatra. And so um, the, the immediate cause of the decision to attack Pearl Harbor uh, was this, this need to solve this oil problem. And so yeah, oil was, was definitely at the very heart of this conflict from the beginning. You know, it's funny because if I look at the two circumstances, Europe versus the Asia Pacific area, in Europe, the criticism of the Western powers was that there was an appeasement of Hitler and he wasn't confronted strongly enough and hence you get a war. What did Churchill say? He called it the unnecessary war, right? It didn't have to happen. The funny thing is, though, is maybe you could make a case that in the Asia Pacific theater, Roosevelt did exactly what the people who want to confront these dictators did. I mean, he didn't appease them. He basically told them, you're going to change your foreign policy or we're going going to take your oil away, and yet you got war anyway. What do you think about the United States' is, um, you know, because there's always been a lot of controversy about the way the Secretary of State played these things and everything. Right. Was this something that the United States was kind of hoping would happen? Or I mean, because certainly I think the U.S. must have had enough politicians who realized that the Japanese can't easily back down from their entire foreign policy goals of the last 15 years. Um, did we stumble into this or was this sort of manipulated in a way that turned out the way the U.S. wanted? You know, I, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a controversial question. It's one that's gotten a lot of attention. I, I tend to think that we stumbled into it more than we intended uh, for, for this to happen. That said, it was clear uh, in the weeks before leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, it was clear to our leaders that the Japanese were preparing to make some sort of a move uh, in the Pacific. Um, we did not anticipate the, the uh, raid on, on Pearl Harbor, despite all of the many conspiracy theories that have been spun in that respect. And yet uh, we did expect war uh, to begin perhaps on that same day, December 7th, war warnings had gone out. Um, and, and I think what's clear is that we had, by that time, uh, we'd been reading the diplomatic mail. This is a really important achievement of our, our um, cryptanalyst program is that we were able to essentially break the, the codes that the Japanese uh, foreign ministry used to communicate with its embassies overseas. We continued to read that mail right through the end of the Second World War. And so we, uh, we knew that, um, that they were essentially preparing uh, some sort of a military uh, move to try to solve their oil problem. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's clear that, that uh, Roosevelt was okay with that. Roosevelt and, and his, um, his, his cabinet uh, understood that the Japanese were likely to uh, break off negotiations and, and attack probably the British and the Dutch, but not us directly. And that uh, that might uh, lead us to, you know, to, to, to solve the political problem, which, which FDR had at home, which was that he simply didn't have the American people united behind this prospect of joining the Second World War, something that he saw by that time was going to be necessary. 
And so uh, I, I think it's it's you know it was a it was a story of of, of stumbling a bit in terms of the way that the embargo the, the various measures were taken throughout 1941. There are several instances in in which it, it was not clear that uh, that the specific steps that were taken uh, to ratchet up these these economic measures uh, were completely in line with the way FDR wanted them to occur. And yet, um, overall, it, you know, we had um, we had had regarded Japanese aggression in Asia as a fundamental uh, threat to the uh, global peace, and uh, and as essentially wrong in itself. And FDR's rhetoric had been crystal clear about that uh, that this kind of aggression against other nations was was dangerous, uh, and it was a contagion uh, which had to be had to be stopped. And so um, certainly we were not going to continue to export oil from West Texas uh, to Japan to allow them to carry on this, this war of aggression against their neighbors. And if, uh, if that was going to lead to an outbreak of war in the Pacific, then so be it. I think our leaders were ready for that. So then that makes me wonder about the other side's ability then to respond or be flexible. Um, I think this is maybe why everyone spends so much time diagramming the way the Japanese government is set up to show you the dysfunction in it or the, you know, that the, the, the period right before the Second World War in the 20s and 30s was sometimes referred to as a government by assassination, where you have these these lower level officer types having an outsize influence on overall policy. And it seems like, in a sense, I mean, I, I was always moved by the fact that a bunch of the Japanese leaders at the end of the Second World War who are running the country have bullets still in their body, you know, from assassination. Fascination yeah. attempts. So, so you get this sense of how much leeway did any of these particular leaders or or, or influential people in the Japanese uh, um, uh, governmental system, because you know they have those higher up sort of the elder statesman types too. Um, how much did that government have the ability? I, I just feel like they were almost paralyzed sometimes uh, in terms of their ability to break this logjam that whether it was the army or radical politicians or whatever. I mean, it's almost like they got pulled to the extremes and no one had the ability to do anything about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I wouldn't say it was almost, they were almost paralyzed. I would say that it was a paralytic form of government. The Meiji constitution, which was the, the form of government that, uh, Hirohito's grandfather had essentially given to the Japanese people as a gift. That's the way it was presented. Um, it was a, a document which reserved quite a bit of power for the emperor, particularly to command the armed forces directly. And yet it was, uh, it was ambiguous in many ways. And uh, what had happened really was that after Meiji died, his successors, including Hirohito, were not strong enough personalities to continue to assert uh, the considerable power that 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 they had uh, over the state and over the military, in particular, under that that document and through a series of legal precedents, um, it had uh, the system that had evolved by the 1930s essentially put the the um, emperor in a very constrained role, where in particular, if his advisors, his military advisors, and his cabinet presented him with a, um, a consensus recommendation, he essentially was required uh, to approve of that. And so uh, the military, which had really taken control of the government, every aspect of the government, not just foreign policy, but domestic policy as well, um, the army and the Navy who were co constantly at each other's throats in a struggle for power, for control of resources, for control of, of directing the foreign policy of the country, um, they realized that as long as they could come to some kind of rough and ready consensus that Hirohito would simply have to rubber stamp whatever they wanted to do. And, um, and, and this became a, a more and more costly feature of the Japanese regime as the crisis approached in 1941 until finally uh, it, became, <clears throat> it became necessary for uh, the military leadership to, to go ahead with this war that many of them really didn't believe in, particularly in the Navy, because the alternative was going to be a complete breakdown of this sort of fragile uh, consensus balance that had kept Japan from descending into a civil war. And so yes, violence, political violence, assassinations, uh, that was always uh, right beneath the surface. It, it, you know, it was at its height in the 1930s, a period where you just had you know, one assassination after another, one act of violence and intimidation coming up from the middle ranks of the army in particular, uh, aimed at the leadership. Uh, and then that settled down in 
during the war itself, and, and General Tojo was given much of the credit for having essentially sort of imposed this, this fragile peace in, in this nascent civil war in Japan. And then as the, as the end of the war approached and the decision the Japanese confronted the necessity to essentially face up to their own defeat, the threat of assassinations of, of, of civil disorder, of violence, once again, that became a primary concern. And so uh, really in the, the complex series of events that finally led to the Japanese decision to surrender after we had dropped two atomic bombs um, was occurred against this backdrop of, as you say, this kind of constant uh, threat of violence from and in, 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 in military insurgency, which could lead to a coup d'etat, which in turn would lead to the destruction of Japan because it would make it impossible for Japan to surrender. And so, yes, it, it was a real mess. Uh, this, this entire regime uh, was essentially entirely dysfunctional. Uh, the dysfunction of the regime explains both the decision uh, to go to war, to, to launch themselves into a war that many of their leaders, even before the attack on Pearl Harbor, recognized that they could not win. And it also explained the long delay in acknowledging uh, Japan's defeat, which their military leaders understood perfectly well. Even a year before the surrender, they understood that they were defeated and that essentially surrender or some sort of negotiated settlement if they could get it, which would amount to surrender, that that was inevitable and the only the only possible future for Japan. You know, when you get to 1945 and you see you'd mentioned how crazy it is by then, it always strikes me that as we, because we still have these debates today about uh, dropping of atomic bombs or, or fire bombings or, or, or strategic bombing at all, um, and, and how difficult it is from our position, I mean, it's, it's a stereotype almost, a trope, but how difficult it is from our position now in cold blood to try to assess the madness that's going on and, and, the, and the destructive, um, uh, you know, it, it, there's a building of it, right? When you look at the bombing in 1939, versus the 1945 version of, I mean, you almost have to build up to something like that. And then right. when you try to assess it 70 or 80 years later, it looks relatively insane, right? It looks like the, the analog version of the nuclear war where they're so, that we're so scared about now. How do you explain to people, and you know, you're an expert at this, you do this, how do you explain to people in cold blood today um, the hot blood decisions to do things like firebombing Tokyo in a way that makes sense to them? How do you take them into a crazy world? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I agree with you about that. I, I think that the only way you really can do it is by telling the entire story of the conflict from beginning to end. Uh, and that's the only way it makes sense. The only way the firebombing of Tokyo or the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki makes sense to me is if I go back to um, uh, the Chinese, uh, the Japanese invasion of China in 1937, the extraordinarily uh, awful uh, massacres that went on. Um, the, the barbarism of, of the Japanese army, the way it uh, behaved toward uh, civilians in the areas that it, it occupied, uh, its behavior toward prisoners of war, including our prisoners of war. Uh, and you really have to tell the whole story. Uh, you have to tell the story of how there was this no surrender ethic, uh, which had been inculcated into the Japanese military, and the way that they really observed that. Uh, on one island after another, essentially uh, dying to the last man, uh, refusing to surrender. Uh, the way on places like Saipan, uh, the, um, you had mass suicides of, of Japanese civilians uh, rather than falling into the hands of Americans who were, I think, in good faith, trying to save their lives. Um, and, and when you saw this cult of death occurring, uh, then it became much easier to think in terms of, well, you know, the Japanese are essentially behaving, their, both their rhetoric and their behavior indicates that what they're saying is we're going to have to kill all of them in order to end this war. Uh, literally every last man, woman, and child of Japan. <clears throat> we don't want to do that, um, but inevitably we're going to have to kill a lot of Japanese until uh, they come to their senses. And um, uh, so, you know, you really uh, had this kind of inversion of of what I would say were a traditional understanding of, of military ethics to the point where the, the most important thing was to try to end the war quickly uh, by any means necessary, including um, trespassing upon those traditional ideas of uh, separating the, the um, 
a civilian from the military target. And, uh, and that occurred in, in, uh, in Germany as well, uh, by the way. And so, uh, again, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's hard to sort of sit down with someone who doesn't know the history and to lay it out uh, without going back and really telling the entire story. And so um, that's, that's what I set out to do in this uh, three volume history. And I don't think that the story can be told in any less than the, you know, 1800 pages that I took to tell it. Do you think a land invasion of the home islands would have happened? I do not think uh, that it, we would have invaded Japan. Um, I, I think that it was uh, perhaps we we knew that we needed to have the option, which is why we placed such enormous preparations uh, for Operation Downfall, the invasion first of Kyushu and then of Honshu. Um, but the target date for the first stage of that invasion, the invasion of Kyushu, Operation Olympic, uh, was November 1st, 1945. We dropped the bomb on uh, Hiroshima in the first week of August. That's almost three months. And so the question really, it becomes a counterfactual, what would have happened in those three months? And, um, and I think for all we know about uh, what was happening in Tokyo, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to imagine that the government would have uh, continued to, to want to fight that this, this struggle that they were that they were undertaking to try to surrender, um, that that would not have succeeded in those three months. Uh, particularly when you consider that the that the conventional bombing campaign was really growing by leaps and bounds, uh, really week by week. And so even in the absence of the atomic bombs, um, uh, I I think it's very unlikely that we would have launched an invasion of Japan. You know. It, we dance around these issues, I think, when we talk about it, about how really different the Japanese are and how unique in so many ways. I mean, it makes me wonder about the challenges of historians who aren't Japanese trying to, you know, like I, I would read, uh, th there are some wonderful books we used for the show uh, written about Japan, but many of them by Western experts. And I, I, I think to myself... Um, not only that that maybe you might have to be Japanese to understand some of this stuff, but that maybe even the modern day Japanese aren't in a position to assess this because it was so different even in that country 70 or 80 years ago from, I mean, it's a transformed society. Um, is it becoming, you know, I used to think when I was younger that that because you would meet people who were veterans in the war and people who had been there, they seemed like flesh and blood. As I get older, they, they almost seem like trying to assess Alexander the Great or the Mongols or, I mean, it's getting to be a society that's in the past. Does that make sense when we write about this? We're trying to get into the minds of people who aren't around anymore and, and a sort of a societal ethic. I mean, there are no more Hiru Onodas or, or, or kamikaze pilots in Japan. I mean, is this a this goes back maybe to why people deal with the opening in the 19th century so much. Or when I was growing up, they used to talk about the Japanese being a, a medieval society that had been brought into the modern world. But they almost seem culturally like an extreme manifestation of humanity by the Second World War. Um, how does the fact that the Japanese are so different play into all this? I mean, I know my stepfather was overwhelmed by the kamikaze ph uh, uh, phenomenon when he was in the war. Um, how much does that play a role in this? They just seem like the most unusual people. I mean, that that's an open-ended question, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. There's a fascination about the Japanese in this war because they're singular, aren't they? Yeah, no, they, it's, it's really true. And it's um, putting yourself into the mindset of, of the Japanese in, during, during this war has been a tremendous challenge for everyone who's written about it. Um, and I think there's something to what you say. I mean, the you know Japanese of 2021 trying to understand the Japanese of 1941. It's it's not easy. There also have been very powerful taboos which still exist in Japan that kind of govern the way people think about, talk about, write about the war. Um, that said, there has been uh, quite a quite a burst of of scholarship, both by Western scholars of Japan and by Japanese scholars, which has appeared in English translation in the past 25 years. And I think there's a lot more to be done, actually. If you look across all of World War II, across uh, the whole the whole global landscape, um, I think a lot of the most interesting scholarship of the next uh, several decades is going to be in, in trying to get a better understanding of what precisely happened in Japan uh, in those years. And um, uh, just to get even more futuristic on you, I think you know machine learning, AI, 
um, which is eventually going to eliminate language barriers in archives. I think there's going to be a tremendous um, improvement in our understanding collectively of what happened there uh, as those new new tools start to start to start to bear on the issue over the next few decades. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, again, it, it really comes down to kind of understanding this conflict in the way that our ancestors who fought it understood, under, understood. and that's, that's where there's a strong case to be made for narrative history, something that I do, something that you do as well as a podcaster, trying to go back and, and help um, people understand what, were, what was in the minds of those who were there at the time making the decisions, fighting these battles, um, the, you know, from the, the guys in the, in the trenches, on the decks of the ships in the cockpits to those who are, are in the uh, headquarters uh, making decisions from a military standpoint to the halls of power in Washington and in Tokyo, understanding this entire conflict, the way it unfolded week by week, uh, I think is, is the really the best way to try to get closer to the way uh, that it was understood by, by those who were there. There are parts, too, that fade into the background until you start reading about them and you go, oh, really, this is hard to relate to. For example, uh, and you touched upon it with the Japanese, but I'm fascinated with the American version of it, too, the inter-service rivalries. Yep. And, and because I think these days, at least the general consensus among civilians is that, oh, the services work well together in the United States and whatnot. To, to truly understand, I mean, I was reading... Um, I was reading one book and they were talking about uh, it was a scene uh, on Guadalcanal, I think it was. And there was a it was an army officer who was berating a Marine. And there was another Marine in the distance who cocked his rifle or something. It was it was portrayed as a scene where this Marine was going to frag this army officer for yelling at another Marine. Um, the Japanese inter-service rivalry literally decided, you know, the direction the war would take often. But but people don't realize. And, and this includes yours truly. You know, I remembered it, but I really didn't remember it until you started diving into Douglas MacArthur's uh, paranoid fantasies about the Navy and all this stuff. Can you talk a little about the inter-service rivalry and how it determined kind of the way things went? Yeah. Well, you know, our military um, before, and a lot of people don't know this, including a lot of people who've read a lot about World War II, um, <clears throat> we did not have a Joint Chiefs of Staff organization prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was a, a board, which was sort of a liaison organization of generals and admirals who kind of loosely coordinated their planning. Uh, but there was really no um, sustained attempt to blend the operations of the Army, the Navy, uh, and what was emerging as these two other services under the umbrella of the Army and Navy, the Army Air Forces, uh, and in the case of the Navy, the Marines. Um, both sort of emerging as increasingly independent organizations within the Army and, and uh, the uh, War and Navy departments. And so really we, we, had, um, we had a very sort of decentralized, um, poorly coordinated military prior to the war. And it was really only under the pressure of the emergency of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then the first uh, British uh, summit, uh, which occurred literally just weeks after Pearl Harbor when the Churchill and his... Um, military uh, uh, chiefs came to Washington to sort of begin to plan how we were going to deal with this crisis. And it was only under that pressure that our uh, chiefs, our chief of naval operations and our army chief of staff, George Marshall, uh, got together and said, listen, we, we've got to have some sort of way of organizing ourselves. So why don't we just start meeting? And they called themselves the Joint Chiefs. All of that was ad hoc. Uh, there was no legislative charter. And, um, and essentially they just uh, ran the war as this sort of informal committee. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff organization was not formally codified in our laws until uh, 1947 with the National Security Act. It created the, the structure that exists today at the Pentagon. And so <clears throat> all of that is just a long-winded way of saying uh, that our military really was not prepared to fight uh, a global war which would require these different services to work together in sustained and intricate cooperation. They had to figure that out uh, on essentially week by week as they were dealing with this military emergency. In the Pacific, uh, the problem was even greater than it was in, in Europe, certainly was an issue in Europe as well. But in the Pacific, you had, uh, as I said earlier, looking at a map of the Pacific, you, you quickly grasp that the fundamental strategic problem is how do you deal with the rampaging Japanese fleet? You have to destroy Japanese naval power 
before you can project your military forces across the Pacific in a way that will force Japan to surrender. And so that's a job for your Navy and also your air forces. Your air forces, of course, you have naval and army air forces. They have to work together. And then you have to take uh, islands uh, to, as naval bases, as air bases, uh, and to support the logistics drive across the Pacific. And to take islands, you essentially have to develop this, this uh, particularly specialized um, branch of warfare called amphibious warfare. Uh, which the Marines had really focused on, and, and they were the organization that was best prepared, had done the most training, had developed the equipment uh, for for um, storming even heavily defended beaches that were in some cases thousands of miles away from any uh, allied base. And so uh, the very nature of the Pacific War was that you had to uh, force these services, which were not prepared to work together, to work together. And in, in doing so, of course, uh, that would expose all of the frictions, the prejudices, the biases, the parochialism uh, that um, uh, was natural among military leaders who had grown up in these very siloed kinds of organizations. And overlaid on top of that, just to make the whole thing even more complex, uh, you had in Douglas MacArthur, a sort of a singular figure, really no one else like him in the American military, in any branch of the American military. Someone who became very, very famous very quickly, uh, literally just in the week, the two weeks after Pearl Harbor had skyrocketed to this kind of position of um, being regarded almost as a kind of demigod by the American people because of the, the lavish press coverage that his campaign in the Pacific had received. And he was a, I think fair to say, a kind of narcissistic figure uh, who really wanted to place himself at the center of this conflict against Japan, uh, was jealous of others who would receive attention and who, uh, you know, very aggressively was willing to use his fame, his political influence, uh, in order to try to force the war uh, to be fought according to the ideas that, that he had uh, on how it should be fought, which really meant returning to the Philippines first. Uh, and, uh, and, and essentially, in order to <coughs> accommodate uh, MacArthur's uh, immense personality. Uh, the way the war was set up was we divided the Pacific into two separate theaters. And you had MacArthur in Australia, the command in the South Pacific. Then you had the Navy with Nimitz as commander in chief in Hawaii. Uh, and his realm included essentially everything north of the equator. Uh, and these two guys uh, both reported to the Joint Chiefs in Washington. And, um, and, and they could talk to each other informally. Uh, but any conflict between them would have to be resolved in Washington. And so you had that element laid atop uh, what was already a pretty messy situation in the way that the services had to, to work together. And so when you, when you look at all of those issues, all of those problems, uh, all, of, all of those, those frictions, those inherent frictions, um, it's remarkable, I think, that our military was able to, to kind of get itself together uh, and win this war in less than four years. Well, and you think about, I mean, you know, you talked about MacArthur almost being a demigod, but I feel like it's a pan, you know, when you look at all of the, the august military figures from that day, it's like a giant cast of stars with MacArthur maybe as the, as the superstar. But I think about how overwhelming these people were in terms of force of personality and the, and the depth of their experience that when some guy like FDR, who has been the ringmaster sort of, who, who for so many years is able to juggle all these enormous personalities and work them against each other and charm them all, when he leaves the scene because he dies in office and leaves it to a guy who's been vice president for about two seconds mm -hmm. and who doesn't necessarily... Uh, remind one of some uh, august, super strong personality, and you throw him into a room where he's got to make decisions between these people who may be of different opinions on things, right? Um, it makes me wonder how different the war would have gone had FDR managed to to ride it out health-wise until the end. Uh, how much does a green Harry Truman change things, or does it just sort of run on autopilot, do you think, um, because of the, you know, you got, you, you're not going to over, overwhelm a MacArthur, who FDR once called, as you know, uh, one of the two most dangerous men in the world, along with Huey Long. You're not going to overwhelm him. As a matter of fact, we, as we know, that, that will come to a head in the next war in Korea, where Harry Truman and Douglas MacArthur will bump heads. But, I mean, it, do, does it run on autopilot, or do you think Truman put his, his stamp on the way the war finished up at all? 
Well, I think the, the war in Europe was, was virtually done. Um, FDR died, I think, almost exactly a year before um, Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. Um, and so uh, I would say that um, the situation in Europe, at least the war in Europe, uh, was on autopilot. The negotiations with Stalin in particular were not. Uh, and so um, Truman definitely had to step into some very large shoes there quickly. The war in, in, in um, the Pacific, there is a lot of counterfactual speculation that you can do in the scenario where FDR lived. Um, you know, so much of, of our government's um, uh, thinking about how to end the war in the Pacific turned on this idea of, you know, what is um, this unconditional surrender formulation require of us? FDR had set this thing out. He had, it was a very personal decision that he made to make unconditional surrender uh, the, um, the, the uh, essentially the asking price uh, for peace. And uh, you know he had gone back to to an inaccurate anecdote about how the American Civil War had ended, um, but clearly what he had in mind was avoiding a reprise of the end of the First World War in Europe, in which the seeds of of the Second World War had been planted and the rise of Nazism after uh, the Treaty of Versailles, and so he he wanted to to be sure that Germany and Japan were defeated utterly and, and critically that the people of those countries understand, understood that they had been defeated utterly. And so he had insisted upon this unconditional surrender formulation. And then he dies and, and our, our leaders are kind of left with this question of, well, we have to, we have to do justice to, to what our, our dead chief uh, wanted. Uh, and for our own credibility, we have to insist upon unconditional surrender. But what does that mean exactly, unconditional surrender? It seems simple, but when you start to spin out all the possible permutations of how a surrender might occur, uh, it raises uh, more questions than it answers. And so uh, Truman steps into this situation in which we, you know, we do not have a very clear idea of, of what we expect from the Japanese in terms of how this surrender will occur. We do not want to invade those islands. Uh, we have this new weapon, the atomic bomb. Uh, Truman, by the way, had not been briefed on the existence of the atomic bomb, which seems like an extraordinary oversight, um, <laughs> considering that FDR was in failing health. His doctors knew he was in failing health. Uh, and, and yet uh, Truman was simply not prepared. He had not been properly briefed. Uh, and it, it seems like really an extraordinary failure of um, uh, just the principles of constitutional government. And that's something that I think FDR has to, his, his legacy has to, has to be charged uh, with that failure. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so the, the counterfactual questions are, you know, would we have used the atomic bombs in the way that we use them? Uh, you know, so, so often the, the question of the atomic bombs is kind of reduced to a binary, should we or shouldn't we have used them? I think the harder question is, should we have used them in the way that we use them? In particular, should we have dropped them without any sort of explicit prior warning? And should we have dropped them on cities rather than on a military base, at least the first one? And, um, and, and it's, you know, it, you, one can only speculate really because there is so little that FDR said, there's so little in the, in the historical record indicating what his thinking was, particularly about the use of these weapons. Um, and yet, uh, I think it's clear that he would have uh, seen them as a weapon that should be used if there was a way to avoid invading Japan. Um, and yet, uh, would he have consented to drop them on cities rather than on military targets? I think that's a hard question to ask. I think certainly you could argue that FDR uh, would have said, we dropped the first one on a military target. I'm the commander in chief. I've, I've said uh, what we're doing and I'm not taking any back talk from any of you guys was with uh, gold braid and stars. Certainly he, he would not have felt any compunction about ruling directly on the question in that respect uh, in a way that Truman, I don't think was ready to do that. That's the real counterfactual, I think, is would we have used the bombs in the way that we use them if F FDR had lived? And, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I think it's speculative, but I think there are some good reasons to believe that we would not have used them in the way that we use them uh, had uh, FDR lived through the end of the war. You know, when you look at the Second World War, um, 
you know, you read book, books like Neil Ferguson's works, for example, and, and you realize what a, what a large role race played in the whole thing. So in, in Europe, you have the whole master race question involved in, in Nazi ideology. In Asia, both sides can be called racist because the Japanese have, have a sort of a master race philosophy. The Americans and the, uh, and the British and the French and the Western powers look upon the Japanese the way they look upon a lot of different non-white peoples. Um, how much, and there have been a lot of good works lately about the racial aspect, but, but if we were fighting, and I don't want to say fighting Scandinavians, because basically everything we did to the Japanese, we did to the Germans, too, in terms of bombing and everything else. And the atomic bomb was developed to be dropped on Germany. So in that sense, but, but how much does, do you think now, if we had more of the, I, I was going to say racial, uh, racial tolerance thinking of the sort we have today, but some would argue about that. But I think it would be a different war compared to the 1940s um, views on race that weren't just something in the West, but that most countries had a different view on uh, skin color, culture, background, uh, stereotypes and all that kinds of stuff. Talk to me a little bit about the, the race idea in the Pacific Asia theater in the Second World War. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, clearly race, race hatred was, was at the center of the of propaganda of both the uh, allies and the Japanese. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was partly the way that the Japanese had, had conducted themselves during the war, I think, aroused this peculiar race hatred. Uh, many of those who would engage in the most awful sorts of rhetoric. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of a, a, a parade that occurred in Fifth Avenue in Manhattan in June 1942, is the same month as the Battle of Midway. Uh, and it was essentially a parade to celebrate the city's uh, participation, mobilizing for war. And they had these huge parade floats, uh, which were rats uh, and wearing Japanese army uniforms. Um, and uh, and you, you almost have to sort of rub your eyes when you see these things. You realize it's not that long ago, it's within living memory in New York City, uh, in, in which really the most virulent sorts of um, metaphors were used to denounce an entire race of people. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, was a, it was a different time, it was a different war. Uh, many of those who engaged in, in that, that sort of uh, you know, r racist uh, rhetoric uh, were also genuinely sympathetic to the Chinese and saw the Chinese as our allies and, um, and, and were moved by the suffering of the Chinese at the hands of the Japanese. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I just think I, one of the undertold stories just occurring to me now in, in the Pacific was the role of the Nisei, the Japanese Americans. We, we know well that one of the most decorated regiments in the army was a Japanese American Hawaiian regiment that fought in Italy. Um, but uh, you had Japanese Americans from Hawaii and, and uh, California and the West Coast uh, who were um, uh, serving as translators uh, during these, these battles in um, Okinawa and Saipan and the Philippines. And uh, there were cases of extraordinary, extraordinary heroism uh, on the part of these Americans, many of whom had their families interned in camps uh, back home. Who were would um, you know? There's a there's a story of a uh, you know one of these guys who's really just his job is just to be a translator. But you know he grabs a grenade, he goes, he knocks on the hatch of a Japanese tank, he addresses them in Japanese, telling them that he has a message from the colonel. They open the hatch, he drops a grenade in. Um, you had uh, uh, Japanese American translators descending into caves in Okinawa, negotiating for the surrender face to face with people who could easily kill them. Um, volunteering to do this, not because they were ordered to do it. Uh, and, and when you, when you um, realize that they were making these kinds of sacrifices, you realize, um, you know, just how perverse it was really for us to have allowed uh, our own propaganda in many cases to use the kinds of, um, uh, you know, really repulsive uh, racial stereotypes and uh, hateful rhetoric that, that we engaged in. And, you know, I don't see myself as a prosecutor. Uh, you know, I, I think you have to recognize that this was a very different time and very extreme circumstances. And yet, when you look at that, uh, certainly as an American, you, you, you sort of wish that we could have done some of those things differently. You know, it's funny, though, those sorts of backdrops do allow for 
uh, some of the more wonderful human moments to come out. I'm, I'm reminded there was a, I think it was in John Tolan's book, there was a, a scene during the the Bataan Death March, I think it was, where some Japanese officer, I'm going to get it wrong here, but but sees like a class ring on one of the Americans from like Notre Dame or USC or something and walks up and embraces them because they were there and said, you know, what class were you? I mean, right. those moments where because you're in such a hell, those those human those little human connections seem to stand out so much more. Um, and, and, you know, I think about, and you'd mentioned the, the prisoners of war and all that. One of the things that when you talked, and there are very few of them left, I guess, but when you talked to, to veterans from the Second World War, did you ever notice the difference in the, in the Pacific veterans' um, remembrances or attitudes after the war and, and the ones in the European theater or in North Africa or in Italy? Uh, it just seemed like there was a lot more lingering uh, bitterness on the Pacific veterans' parts, uh, at least in my experience. Did you notice that as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there were many, many um, uh, American and, and I, I, I think also allied British Canadian, Australian, New Zealand uh, troops um, who just ne never were able to to um, overcome this kind of deeply felt hatred for all Japanese and you know, for the entire nation uh, of the Japanese. Interestingly, um, there is a, a, a real difference in the way that those troops who served in the occupation in Japan after the war felt. And, and I don't have any survey data I means you know if, if there had been some survey data i think it would have borne this out because it's it's it was a, a fascinating pattern that i've seen in my interviews with hundreds and hundreds of world war ii veterans those who were in japan after the war serving with the occupation they tended to have a much more nuanced view of the japanese and even very warm feelings uh toward the japanese they grasp very quickly uh that the way that um the japanese army had conducted itself on the battlefield uh, and the way that many of our prisoners had been treated was not a reflection of the Japanese people overall, but were those were specific crimes committed by specific people. And that uh, ordinary Japanese people had been, in a sense, victims of the war as well. That was a, a realization that came much more uh, naturally in my experience, uh, speaking again just to many hundreds of veterans, uh, for those who, who had been served in Japan after the war. Uh, as opposed to those who had never really set foot in Japan and had just come straight home from the war. Yes, well, so just close contact always has the <laughs> opportunity yeah. for people to get to know one another on sure. a human sure. level. Sure. Um, so, so, and I'll, I, I won't keep you very much longer, but I'm curious about like how you filter through um, the, the the Cold War. Um, 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 opaqueness. So, so, for example, when I was younger, trying to figure out the role of the emperor in Japan was always colored by uh, the needs of the Cold War and having Japanese cooperation early on. Um, you know, you had talked also about records becoming available, and it makes me think of Chinese records now and, and former Soviet records that the Russians are releasing. Um, in, in, in the sense of trying to rewrite the history of, of the Second World War based on uh, the the What's the word I'm looking for? The the fact that there were, I mean, let's let's start with Hirohito's role. Um, Herbert P. Bix wrote a whole book on Hirohito, and I remember being amazed how much it conflicted with uh, the the Hirohito as a puppet figure that I had been taught. Um, wh what is your view on that, and how do you how do you work your way as a, as a researcher through the deliberate um, uh, story of the Cold War that maybe tries to hide some of Hirohito's uh, uh, ability to influence some of these decisions? Yeah, well, I, you know, I was a boy in Japan, um, Dan. I, I was in Japan from uh, 1978 to 1981. I was age. Oh, 11. I had no idea. I was age 11 through 14. Um, my father was uh, working for an international bank in Japan, and uh, Hirohito was the emperor then. And uh, that's you know, right. We, we would actually go to the uh, you know, we'd go to the imperial palace on his birthday. We see him out there, you know, waving to the crowds. He was a beloved figure. We had a, a live-in uh, housekeeper who, you know, had a photo of him and who spoke of him as, you know, almost like a personal father figure. And so, um, you know, all of that is is very sort of personal and and, um, and you know, sort of a visceral understanding of they really had this this. Um, he was more than a, a king, really. He was no no longer a god. Uh, and I'm talking about the period when I was there as a boy. Um, and yet there were still these deep feelings of affection 
that ordinary Japanese had felt toward him. And so, <clears throat> you know, clearly um, the Japanese needed, uh, I mean, it, it was understood that the, the co continuation of the imperial house after the war was in our interests in order to ease the occupation. Um, when uh, there were calls for Hirohito to be arrested as a war criminal, potentially prosecuted along with the, the other Japanese war criminals at the Tokyo war crimes trials, uh, um, MacArthur, who opposed this, uh, said to Washington, listen, if you want to do this, I need at least 800,000 more troops. Uh, <laughs> and that quickly put an end to this talk of arresting Hirohito. And so uh, there were immediate contingent reasons why it was clearly the right thing to do in order to ease this occupation, or, or at the same time to kind of get Japan back on its feet as a bulwark against communism, because very quickly, as you say, our concern in Asia and throughout the world shifted toward, toward holding the Soviet Union back, and then, and of course, China after the Civil War there. Um, and so for all of those reasons, it just made sense to keep Hirohito on his throne and to make him into a partner. Um, and again, for those same reasons, it was not in our interest to expose precisely the degree to which uh, he really had played an active role uh, in um, uh, commanding his military forces, uh, at least after the attack on Pearl Harbor. His, his role is, is sort of muddled, it's ambiguous. He, he resisted the drift toward war and then he supported it after it seemed, had seemed to go well. Uh, and so uh, it was really after his death in, in 1989 that some of the uh, documents that exposed this, this greater role that he had played that Herbert Bix uh, outlined in his Pulitzer Prize winning biography you mentioned, uh, in particular the document known as the soliloquy, which was um, uh, essentially a series of notes taken by Hirohito's private secretary in which he had uh, reminisced about different aspects of the war. Uh, which showed really that he had played this much more active role. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's it's been a process since 1989 for the Japanese to gradually um, come to understand uh, that their emperor, you know, had not been the person who was presented to them in the mythology. Um, and that's continuing. And their role with their imperial house is today very ambiguous. You've had an emperor who's actually advocated something that had not happened before. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I think that often in the West, we, you know, we, we, we tend to say the Japanese simply haven't faced up to their history. I think that they, that's still true to a degree, but, but um, it, it often misses the fact that there has been quite a bit of progress in Japan uh, in um, uh, beginning to, to face up to a greater extent uh, to the importance of this history. And, and um, you know, now that the eyes of the world are on Tokyo as the Olympics start, um, you know, I, I just don't see any possibility that in their opening ceremony they would go back and try to explain their history, uh, of at least that part of their history. Uh, but there may a day may come when when the Japanese, a future generation of Japanese, may be more willing uh, to sort of examine in a more public way uh, what happened in their period of their dark valley, the 1930s through the their defeat in 1945. I think that's a human thing. I think I think most countries in the world have parts of their population that have a hard time going back and analyzing painful periods when maybe the best decisions or the best actions weren't made. Uh, before I let you go, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you'd like to convey? The, 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 the three-book series is a triumph. If you haven't read it, folks, um, we used it extensively. You have a wonderful way of finding the best historical anecdotes to, to pepper the story with that just really, really gives a great sense of the context. Is there anything uh, that I didn't ask you about that's worth talking about before I let you go? You know, something I was just thinking of my, as I was out walking this morning, um, <clears throat> you often, in, in your podcast, you often come up with these, these kinds of metaphors that no historian would have thought of to make up a, a point. Well, for and their that, career's sake, probably. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, but often they kind of, kind of get to the heart of something. And, and um, you know, I, I was just thinking in, in the Pacific War, we had um, what I lay out in the book as being the cumulative versus the sequential strategy. The cumulative strategy is essentially the campaign across the Pacific, island by island, battle by battle. You can diagram it on the map with arrows. It's the march across the Pacific toward Japan. Then you had the um, what they called the cumulative strategies, which were uh, like the submarine war against Japanese shipping. 
or strategic bombing of Japanese industries and cities. And these are, rather than discrete battles, uh, these are, are military actions which have this kind of cumulative effect of undermining the Japanese uh, economy, their ability to wage war. And one of the fascinating questions, sort of higher order strategic questions in the Pacific was, uh, how do you allocate your resources to these two different ways of fighting this war? Often your field commanders uh, really are thinking only of the next battle. Um, and and uh, one of the things that I think our, our military eventually did right, although it took us a while to kind of get, get the hang of it, uh, was to devote much more effort to this cumulative sort of attack on the, on the, um, the, the cornerstones of the Japanese economy and war effort. And, and so that, that question, you know, how do you allocate resources between those two very different wars that are happening at the same time? Uh, a metaphor, uh, I'm a baseball fan, and a, a metaphor occurred to me, which is, you know, how do you evaluate a baseball player uh, who may be a great hitter and a lousy fielder, or another, uh, another um, player who is a great fielder and only an average hitter? So what is the, the value of fielding versus uh, hitting in, in baseball? Now, this is something that for many, many years in the game of baseball, uh, the managers were not getting right because they didn't have the data analytics uh, to go in and analyze that, that um, problem in a systematic way using the data that baseball provides. And all of that has changed. Michael Lewis's money ball is probably the best account of, of this revolution in baseball. We had a bunch of data analysts who really knew nothing about baseball, but were very, very good at analyzing data. Uh, there's a metaphor there in the way that our military forces at a high level had to confront this question of how should we use our forces? Should we dedicate them to the cumulative versus the operational, uh, the um, sequential strategies? And, um, and, and eventually the answer was, uh, we should be doing a lot more on the cumulative side uh, and that became one of the important factors that led to a much earlier defeat of, of Japan than uh, we had anticipated at the beginning of the war. That's fascinating. I would the, the connection with Moneyball and, and the Second World War long-term <laughs> overall strategy. Ian W. Toll, your work is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the program. And uh, I look forward to what's next. Any any hints? Well, I'm trying. I'm trying my hand at fiction. I'm sorry to say, um, I wanted a new challenge. <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> but I did promise my editor that I eventually would write a sequel to Six Frigates, so that's on deck. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. That was a ton of fun. My thanks to Ian Toll for coming on the program. I don't know when you're going to get this, but uh, his three-book boxed set will either be out by the time you hear me or um, soon afterwards. It includes Pacific Crucible, The Conquering Tide, and Twilight of the Gods, and he has a lot of other books as well. So check him out. If you like what we do, I bet you'll enjoy what he does as well. Just a reminder, keep your eyes peeled. We should have a an interview with an author on a very different subject in the not-too-distant future come out. Two hits in quick succession to make up for the long delay between offerings. Thanks for your patience, and as always, um, thank you for everything, folks. Support us with Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash Dan Carlin or go to our donate page at dancarlin.com forward slash DC dash donate. Have you ever been on a battlefield tour? You know what I'm talking about, right? You, you go to a famous battlefield and you take the tour. And there's a very knowledgeable tour guide and they, they walk you around with the rest of the tour group and they show you the battlefield from, you know, a, a soldier's eye perspective. Show you the salient uh, historical points of interest, gives you a sense of what was going on on the ground back during the battle. I mean, they're really wonderful. And if you get a chance to do that, you should. Those of you who've been lucky enough to go on one of those things, or maybe if you're really lucky, two of those things will vouch for how helpful they are into really giving you a sense of what was going on that no book can really match, for example. Well, during the COVID pandemic, I was contacted by a group of people who do this. They're battlefield tour guides and military historians, and they take people uh, around places like the First World War battlefields in France, right? Well, when the pandemic hit, though, like so many other businesses, 
they were up a creek without a paddle, weren't they? What are you going to do if you're a battlefield tour guide and there's no tourists because of the pandemic? So like many other businesses around the world, they took a look at their business and retooled it and restructured it and reimagined it. And the way they reimagined it, I'm tempted to say it's better than the original, although you know, not, few things beat a good battlefield tour. And they still do that on the ground live, but now they do it virtually as well. And it's so exciting because you know, you may know, I, I get involved in things like immersive experiences and virtual reality and all these ways uh, that I think are key sparks for people to get interested in history beyond the names, beyond the dates, appetizers, right? That's what I always say the podcast is to an appetizer to history. Well, the folks over at Battle Guide Virtual Tours are doing this too. They've, they've turned their tours, which they, as I said, still do live, into virtual events. Combine on-the-ground footage with the expert, you know, the his, historian or the battlefield tour guide. Add drone footage, period footage, the voices of veterans mixed in there. Archival film footage. I mean, a truly interactive and um, fascinating sort of an affair. And if you catch it live, by the way... You get to ask questions as though you were actually there. Now, if you're doing this in real life, these are prohibitively expensive things unless you live near the battlefield. But because it's been turned into a virtual tour, this becomes affordable for almost everybody. And these guys are offering the tours in one-off choices. I mean, you can go look at their catalog and pick any one you want and just buy that. Or you could subscribe and for a lower price per episode, get access to everything they have and everything they're continually adding. I think it's really cool. I love this as a way to sort of democratize for people all over the world, this battlefield tour experience. And think about it this way. There are places that a lot of people get to. I mean, you know, getting a trip to France is not all that unusual. But there are battlefields in these guys' archives or or soon to be that are in places that are very difficult for most people to get to. So a virtual tour may be the best choice for everyone. Check it out, though. They're offering a free one if you want to see what we're talking about here. They're confident that you'll see it and want more, right? So just go to battleguide.co.uk forward slash Carlin, battleguide.co.uk forward slash Carlin. And, you know, add one of those battlefield tours to your shopping cart and then you'll get the discount and you'll get to see it for free. And then you can decide if you like it enough to buy more. But I'll tell you something, this is one of those things where I'm comfortable telling you about it because I'm, I'm, this is the kind of thing I'm all over right? Virtual tours of battlefields uh, by experts utilizing all this technology and any cool thing that comes down the pike probably going to be added to these offerings too. Um, Check it out. Battle Guide Virtual Tours, everything from the Napoleonic Wars to the modern day stuff, specialized in First and Second World War history. It's, um, well, I think it's the future, to be honest, of battlefield tours. And I hope you like what you see.